Welcome to The Crunch with Crib Creative. I'm Jess, and each week we're going to be diving into the stories of some of Perth's best agents and business people, how they got where they are, and what they learned along the way. Welcome to a special edition of The Crunch, recorded live at RE Bar Camp 2018. This episode features Natalie Hoy, giving us some insight on how to sell like a girl. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Natalie Hoy. I'm a sales rep at Acton Mount Lawley. Um, Crib surprisingly and very kindly asked me to have a chat today and they asked me to submit a whole heap of topics. I thought, what the hell am I going to talk about? Um, it had been a particularly busy couple of weeks, you know how, how it goes, seven days a week, early starts, late nights, all of that kind of stuff. Was struggling to put a couple of deals together and I was starting to get um, the sense just from one or two guys in the office that my problem was, you know, that I really wasn't taking the buyers and the sellers by the short and curly, you know, to really sort of crunch them to get the deal done. And Bev Heyman's popped up this post. And that really resonated with me. And then I just put that through as the topic and they went, yeah, that's what you're speaking about. And I went, oh, shit. <laughs> what am I going to say? Um, so, just a little bit of background. Will it work? It won't work. <laughs> am I up? Okay. Um, so women in real estate, women make up a substantial proportion of the real estate professionals in WA. 31% of female principals. Are there any female principals in the room? There you go. Fantastic. You've all trodden the path before me. 43% of sales reps, so nearly half of the sales representatives in Western Australia, and a whopping 87% of property managers. Are there property managers in here? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit more geared towards real estate agents, but, you know, what, what a stunning statistic. I mean, I guess for me, and I come to real estate from a professional background in management consulting and training and things like that, and when I kind of came into the real estate business, um, I had a lot of questions about the traditional way that we do business in the industry. And I went into my first agency that I walked into was a very traditional real estate business. Um, I also had questions about the way that we measure success in our business because our success measures are very much geared towards how much GCI you write, how many properties you sell and what those properties are worth. And there's very few other mechanisms to measure just some of the amazing business that gets done, not just in Western Australia, but across Australia nationally. Um, and if, you know, unless you're hitting those, you know, sort of very high kind of formulas, how do you measure whether or not you're actually, you know, doing a great, you know, having a great business and a successful career in real estate? And so I had a lot of questions about, you know, whether those measures and whether those traditional ways really support the way a lot of women do business, because not all women are necessarily out there to, you know, hit their one mil GCI or sell their 50 to 60 properties a year. There are, you know, women who've got a lot of competing priorities in the business that they need to juggle. But I also wonder about if it indeed supports all men as well. So, yeah, no. <laughs> Yeah, that one back. Thank you. Okay, so what's this about? First off, it's not a feminist rant. We don't need the V to be sitting in the room. <laughs> it is informed. <laughs> it's an in-joke. For those of you who are on the Women in Real Estate Facebook page, you'll know what we're talking about. Um, look, but it is informed by my gender and it is informed my, by my professional background and there may be some generalisations, okay? It's just what it's going to be. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit... A little bit, obviously I just don't have the clicker thumb right. Um, I will talk a little bit about me and my journey. It's the third time lucky. All right, cheers Jess. Um, and I want to talk about what I think is the myth of the one best way. So I think there's a lot of ways that you can do real estate. The trick is to find the way that works for you. There's lots of people that will tell you how to do things in this business and you've got a myriad of different approaches that you can take. 
find what works for you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And that comes to the next point, which is run your own race. We can be our own worst enemies in this business, and Michelle's talked about this before, if any of you follow what Michelle does. It's really about how to set your own benchmarks, work out what you want to do, and run your own race. Um, I think this is really important. It took me a while to find a place that worked for me. And I think the culture and the environment that you work in and that the people that you're surrounded by that either support or hinder you is really important. So I'm sorry, because this one might make some of the principles squirm, but I'm going to talk about choosing where you work wisely. If I don't run out of time, some lessons that I've um, learnt along the way, and I guess the questions will be for the couch out the back if we get there. So a little bit about me. So I've got a background in human resource and management consulting. So I've got um, a graduate diploma in HRD, a Master of Commerce. I've worked um, globally um, for very large multinational organisations and for very small organisations here in <coughs> Perth as well. Real estate was my hobby. I loved property since I was a little kid. I used to love going to open homes and display homes and all of that kind of stuff. I was the go-to girl. I used to, once upon a time when real estate was in the paper, read all the ads in the papers. Friends would ask me what I thought about the value of properties, all of that kind of stuff. And when we were selling for the upteenth time in 2011, and my in-joke is better houses than husbands, um, <laughs> we were selling for the upteenth time, and my real estate agents actually said to me, oh, for God's sake, Natalie, you should just come and work with us. And I was at the time actually doing quite a bit of coaching and I was coaching a lot of amazing people who were making very brave decisions with their lives to follow their passions um, and turn those into their jobs. And I thought, well, why not? Why not, why not have a go? We'll do that and see what happens. You know, no guts, no glory, right? So that's what happened in 2011. Still here today. Um, in 2014, life was getting pretty busy for me. My husband was in a job that he hated. I said, um, the biggest source of um, conflict in our marriage is your work, so why don't you give that up and come and work for me? So, <laughs> so and you're laughing because it's the same kind, yeah. So I have no plan B, it's me. I pay the mortgage, I pay the school fees. That's a bit scary, but it also keeps you very focused and very motivated. In 2015, after a couple of false starts trying to find my place, I joined Acton Mount Lawley. Um, and, you know, I'm blessed to be in an organisation that gives me the space to work the way that I do and supports me to do that as well and to work to my strengths. And we're all very different in terms of the way that we do business um, in our team, but it's genuinely a team and, and I'm supported to do, to, to do things the way I want to do them. And that, for me, has been a real blessing and something that's been particularly freeing and enabled me to really grow my business. Um, I took on my first pay, PA in 2016, and Leah up the back, hello, <laughs> has been with me for, um, for nearly 18 months. And she's an invaluable part of the team. Um, clients love her. Please don't go and poach her. Um, and, um, and that was important for me, for being able to take the next step. And also just to be able to have some time off and some holidays and all of that kind of stuff as well. Um, I love, what, I love to learn. Um, I'm, I love coming to conferences. I love going to training. I follow Tom Panos, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but I don't like being told what to do. So that's just something you need to know about me. <laughs> okay. Why I love real estate. Um, real estate, I think you can treat as a as a transform you can be really transformational in someone's life or you can be very transactional and you can be everything in between. So this on the left, I always get my right and left. On the left hand side is Christine and that's her mum Nadia. So I met Christine about 18 months ago, so she was looking for someone to sell a property in Inglewood. So 
I got the gig, which was fabulous. We sold Christine's property and it all went really well. Um, Christine lives with her, um, her husband, Martin, down in Yelling Up. He set up a building company down there. So I was dealing with a client who was remote, who was looking for lots of feedback um, and, you know, a, a really close relationship and lots of communication about what was going on so she'd feel really comfortable. At the same time, she was trying to sell a property in Swanbourne. That wasn't going so well. They ended up taking that off the market um, and putting it out to rent. She said at the time of selling the one in Inglewood, now, when I sell Swanbourne again, I'm going to get you to do it. I said, no, I'm not going to Swanbourne. I'll find you a great agent, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sell. It's too far out of my patch. Anyway, about six months after Inglewood, she came and she said, Nat, I want to sell the one in Dianella. Tenants moved out. Will you help me with that? I said, love to. Fabulous. Thank you. So we sold Christine's second property. All went really well. Three months ago, Christine rang. She said, look, my tenant's moving out of Swanbourne in two weeks. I want you to sell the house. I said, Christine, we've been through this. I'm not going to help you sell the property in Swanbourne. It's too far out of the patch. Yeah, yada, yada, yada. And she said, Nat, mum's just being diagnosed with a terminal illness. She said, I can't go through the process of interviewing other agents. She said, I just need someone that I can trust on my team, that I don't have to think about, that I know will provide me with good advice and just do the right thing. And I said, oh, what do you say? You know? <laughs> I said, OK. I said, but I can only open it. It'll have to be late on a Saturday or late on a Sunday. I can't give you a 12 o'clock slot, you know, because I can't do the, the commute. Is that OK with you? She said. I trust you, don't care, I know that you'll work your hardest to, to get the result. So, tenant moved out, we staged the property, um, we took the photos, it was on the Tuesday, I rang Christine on the Wednesday to go, you're locked and loaded, you're up online, she said, mum, uh, Nat, mum died last night, you know. Um, we opened it on the Sunday, it was gone by Monday lunchtime, thank fuck. <laughs> <laughs> The market in Swanbourne's doing really well. <laughs> I am thinking of moving. <laughs> um, but that's why I do real estate. This is, this is why I do real estate. I come from a background in HR and management consulting. To me, client relationships were really important. Working with big organisations, and Dave talked about being big, big corporates. You know, doing, I used to do a lot of change management training. A lot of it was banging your head against a brick wall. Um, in real estate, you have the opportunity, if you want to, if that works for you, to do work that's really quite transformational. You can really make a difference in someone's life. You know, that, that's the way you can do it. But also, I work with guys who treat it very transactionally, and that's okay. They're still very successful. They still write amazing business, and I guess there's everything in between. But what, what and I think for a lot of women, the transformational aspect and the relational aspect is really important. Um, I consider it a privilege to serve. And I remember when I first came into real estate, and this is a terrible thing to say, but I talked about the move from um, consulting into real estate. Because when you're a consultant, you're being paid big bucks. You come in, you know, everyone's looking to you for the answer. You know, it's a bit like, oh, here comes the consultant. And when you're in real estate, it's a bit like, here comes the real estate agent. <laughs> It's like, yeah, no, you don't need your garlic. It's OK. Um, but what really surprised me was the people in our industry who are so professional, who do such great business and such great work, who see what they do as a privilege to serve. And I think that was one of the first things I learned from seeing John McGrath speak, um, funnily enough, at, at ARIC not long after I started. And I have a sense of gratitude every day for being able to do that. I can make much more of a difference to someone's life and be much more fulfilled doing what I do now than I ever could before sort of working in the corporate sphere. The other thing that real estate has given me, and don't get me wrong, I work all the hours God sends. When, you know, I work a hell of a lot more than I ever used to in my previous jobs. But it does give me flexibility and it does, does give me choice. It's my choice to work or not work. It's my choice to do the calls or not do the calls. Um, if I want to make the time to go and see something um, at school, I can. So, and for someone that doesn't like being told what to do, having the opportunity to decide when you're going to work and how you're going to work and what you're going to do, that's particularly liberating and freeing. And I think that's a real privilege in our industry. 
Um, and of course, there's the property porn. I love houses. <laughs> I get to sell a lot of really pretty ones. We get very excited when we get a really pretty one. So, you know, there's that side that always gets fulfilled as well. Me selling pretty houses a bit, is a bit of a joke in our office. <coughs> um, I want to talk about the myth of the one best way and this myth of, you know, one size fits all. Because one size does absolutely not fit all. Um, I, love to I love to learn um, and I do listen, but I also have to learn to ignore as well. Because there's lots of people that will tell you how to do this business based on the way that they did it. You have to door knock. You have to cold call. You have to do this. You have to do that. You don't have to do any of it. You have to do, I think, what works for you. Don't get me wrong, you have to work really hard and you have to focus on activity and you have to prospect. But it's finding those things that really work for you. So I think it's really great. I, you know, I don't, I don't understand people that don't come to events like this. I don't understand people that aren't prepared to learn. But at the same time, you've got to pick and choose through all of that what works for you. There's, as David said earlier, you can't not know how to do real estate in 2018. There is so much that's there. It's about finding your way through that. Um, I've, I've sort of talked about that already. There's more than one way to prospect. You know, I've never door knocked and I've never cold called. That's not me. Um, I've never had to do that. But I know people that have built brilliant businesses by doing that. So again, it's finding that way that works for you. Death by dialogue. You know, I, I know real estate agents, um, and, and I think dialogue is something that m men are more predisposed towards getting excited about than women. Do, is that my right? Am I not right? Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff about dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. And I know real estate agents that will train for half an hour, 45 minutes, four or five times a week just on dialogue to try and sound authentic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and if that works for them, great. But I've built my business, and I think this is, and I'm going to you know, make a, ge a generalisation here. I've built my business by having conversations. Um, and, and I think one of the best things that you can learn, but even Tom Panos talks about this, is learn to ask, not to tell. So it's about having conversations and building relationships with clients and asking lots of questions and finding out where they're at. I do think a lot of it is people are looking for that decent human being to, to turn up who's going to understand what it is um, that they're trying, to, trying to, to, to get, what result they want, what their pain points, points are, you know, what's important for them. So, you know, do, look, don't get me wrong, I know I do use a level of dialogue, but I don't dialogue to death. I try to focus on really being present. And I think that's something that, you know, women are quite good at doing. Um, and maybe some men who, and I don't get me wrong again, you know, I think the dialogue can help when you're first starting out and you're struggling with building the relationships and having conversations and all of that kind of stuff to get you started. But don't do it at the expense of being present and kind of really listening to what it is the client's looking for from you. Um, this is my favourite. There is more than one way to negotiate. You know, grabbing your buyers and sellers by the short and curlies does not work all the time. You know, I, I love it when we hear from buyers um, how different I am to work with. And I get that a lot from buyers, particularly young buyers that have had maybe some unsuccessful attempts to buy property. And I had it again this week. Now, it's just been so much better working with you to purchase the property than the other things that we've tried to buy. You can get great prices by not you know, feeling like people are being screwed. You know, going nice can be a long way because people can trust you, you know, and they like you. And guess what? They'll still give you more money, you know. So it's about, again, finding that way to negotiate. And I do think there's not enough training or not enough emphasis on negotiation skill in a lot of the training that's out there. It's all about listing. It's all about prospecting. It's all about winning the appraisal but not really an, a, as much as there probably needs to be in you know, getting those deals together and facilitating an outcome. Um, and that's not always done by knocking heads. And so that's probably one of the points that I run up against with the guys in the office. But you've got to, it comes back to what Nicole was saying earlier and trusting in yourself and trusting your gut as well in terms of the way that you think it needs to be run. Um, there's always time for a good no, and there's always, you know, there's, and you, you, there are times that you absolutely need to be assertive in a situation, but there's not one best way. And that was something I learnt doing leadership and management training. 
Everybody's got different styles. There's different sources of power that you can draw upon. You do need to read your client, but again, not one best way. Um, I think authenticity is hugely important. Do people agree? Yeah. You know, people spot a fake a mile away. You know, I don't understand, I don't understand people, again, coming back to, you know, the little white lies and, you know, all of that kind of stuff in our business. How do, how do you keep up? I'm too busy. You know, like, <laughs> the truth, the, if, if what you're saying is not based in truth, what, what is it in? And I've built a reputation, she gets is that 10 or 5? <laughs> and I've built a reputation, I think, of people being able to trust what I say. So it's, I think it's really important to be authentic. And this is why I come back to, it, you know, you've got to find the way that works for you because otherwise it's not going to be authentic and everybody's going to see through it. Um, and this is my message to, to principals, I guess. The last one. The last one. There we go. A fruit bowl versus a box. One of the things that I learned about, in, in certainly in my um, pre-real estate career, is there's a big, like structures and processes and systems are really important. And in your business, if you want to run a smart, effective business, you've got to have structures and systems. You've got to have things that you're just doing all the time. And the best way you can do that is to systematise them. But the worst thing you can do is create boxes. What you want to do for your own business, if your CEO is your own business, and I, I would absolutely implore principals out there to look at this as well, is this idea of a fruit bowl versus a box. When I talk about a fruit bowl, I'm talking about structures and systems that are a safety net. There are things that are automatic that support the business to do well and to run well. But what you don't want to do is constrain people in a box. Does that make sense? Yeah, I've worked, I've worked in businesses before where it's all been about our way and building the box. And all you're going to do is lose good reps if that's what you're doing. You need to create an environment where they're supported, the systems and the processes are there in place in terms of the agency, but also you want to create them for yourself, for your own business. So you've got your fruit bowl, you've got your safety net that enables you to kind of do stuff on repeat and gives you a level of... Um, I guess, um, consistency in the business. But if, a, if you're a principal, beware of creating a box that constrains people because the best reps are not going to do well in that environment and they're just going to leave you and they're going to go elsewhere. And I think there's a lot of change that's happening in our industry where reps are starting to look at things like personal branding and all of that kind of stuff. I think as a principal, that's the reality and you need to get on board with that because otherwise your best people are going to leave your business. So let's talk about running your own race. For me, and I've got the advantage of coming from a consulting background into real estate, but none of this information, all of this sort of stuff is still available to you in terms of the other training and, and consulting and coaching and all of that that's out there. Um, one of the the things that's been important to us, and particularly in our social media, is Leah and I have spent a lot of time in the last sort of 18 months, two years, again, trying to get really clear on who is our client. You know, who is it that we're talking to? Who's going to be our natural, our natural seller? You know, who are the ones that we're going to be able to quickly and effectively build relationships with who are going to be more likely to use us? Um, I'm pretty lucky because my natural client is me. <laughs> she's female, <laughs> she's of a certain age, <laughs> with certain kinds of interests, and it helps because I live in the area that I sell in as well. So, but I do think it's really important, particularly if you're being very active in the social media space, is to be clear about who you're talking to, otherwise you're not talking to anybody. You know, what are your values and interests for the client, you know, what is it that interests them? What's helpful for them? What is, what is it that you could be tapping into and providing them? You know, how do you make that? It's all about trying to form that connection. And David talked about those different points of connection earlier. This is something that I'm really clear about and I've spent a lot of time working on over the years um, in terms of what are my personal values and my personal strengths. And I am fortunate that I, you know, I run my business and I work within a business that's aligned with my personal values. 
Um, but I have also found a way to work in accordance with my natural strengths. There are, you know, there are, there are things that I don't like doing that I've had to learn to do, don't get me wrong, I'm saying, you know, that, you know, calling's one. Um, you know, so there are things that I don't like doing that I've really had to learn to do and be disciplined about. Um, but I've spent a lot of time also working to my strengths as well. Um, I think it's important to get clear about how do you want to be doing business. Um, I want to be a trusted advisor, simple. You know, that's, that's how I do business. It's like, how can I help? How can I provide people with useful and valuable information so that they can make what are the most, you know, sometimes the most important decisions in their life and trust that I'm the person that's going to help them and support them through that process. And I think, and this is a really big one, what does success look like for you? And this comes back to how we measure success in our industry. And you can get very caught up on metrics or you can work out what success looks like for you. We've got um, Jodie Mazel in our business. I don't know if many of you know Jodie. Um, Jodie does not feature the Rewa Grand Master Awards. Um, Jodie works in a very bespoke area. The last couple of years, she's been getting her girls through the last few years of high school. She does some of the best business in Perth that you'll never hear about. You know, like she is brilliant at matching property to people. She is fabulous. The work that she does is just brilliant. And she's happy doing that. So, you know, she'll sell her two, three million dollar homes. She'll get her great comms. She gets lots of time off. She gets to support her family the way that she wants. And she's an inspiration for me. You know, yes, I might write more GCI than her, but gee, she runs a good business and does really good work. Um, build your personal brand. I think that's really important. That's one of the things that I've focused on since I started in the business. The first real estate business I worked in didn't have a CRM system, can you believe? That was only seven years ago. I got my own and I've had my own all the way through. I've kept my own database. And I've worked very hard to build my personal brand. Um, and that's what's enabled me to be portable and, and, and to move when I've needed to. Um, and to be able to consistently maintain my clients and keep that going forward. I think that's just something principles are just gonna have to accept. That's gonna be more and more of a focus going forward. And um, oh, the turn, I just threw that in, I saw it the other day, Tom Panos. You know, they want you to do well. Did people see the Tom Panos post? They want you to do well, but not better than them. <laughs> yeah, you've, you've got to be very resilient in this business. I'm going to quickly talk about where you choose to work. <laughs> right, here's my simple rules. Don't work with dickheads. <laughs> Rule number two. Don't work with Luddites. <laughs> Technology is such an important part of our business now going forward. You need to be in an organisation that understands that. Um, again, this is another Tom Panos one. See, I do listen. Um, oh, where are we? Oh. Help. Oh. Have we got it? Right. This is absolutely true. The agents that you work, uh, that you hang out with, are the one that you'll become. I think that's really important. I met Tom Panos when he did his first talk at Rewa. Um, he was, he'd finished his, his conversation. He was standing up the back outside the conference hall. No one was around him. Can you believe that? Like, no one was around him. And I walked up and I said, hi, I'm Natalie. You know, Tom, can I ask you a question? I'm in an agency where they're not particularly motivated. They don't do any technology. They've got no interest in social media. Um, they're really nice people, um, but, you know, I'm really self-motivated. Do you think you can be successful if you're really self-motivated but you're surrounded by other people that don't give a crap? And he said, no, you need to get out of there. And he was right. <laughs> um, so the next one is... No, oh, he really doesn't like me. Don't expect handouts. In this business, you need to learn to feed yourself. Um, accept what you can't change, but change what you can't accept. So there's always going to be crap wherever you work. Change what you can't accept, but accept what you can. And the most important thing, work with people you like. Have fun, for God's sake. You know, it's too hard a business and we work too hard. Okay. 
Okay, quickly, some lessons learned. Um, look, our job is relentless. Um, it will take all the hours that you give it. So you've got to find systems and structures that work for you. Um, and I'm still learning how to take time off. It doesn't work particularly well, but there you go. <laughs> Many people will help you. Like, I've, I've been really overwhelmed by the number of people that have supported me in this journey. And I work with Dave. Um, Pete Fletcher's been an instrumental mentor. Um, Michelle's been an inspiration. There's been fantastic people in this room that have helped me on the journey. But no one in this business will do the work for you. Um, consistency is key. Am I just not right? <laughs> consistency is key. David talked about that earlier. Change is a constant. You've always got to keep learning. Um, you are the business. The sooner you work this out, the better you'll be. You are the business. You need to be your own CEO. You need to spend time not just working in your business, but on your business as well. Um, don't take it personally. We, that was Nicole's talk about resilience. I think that's a really important one. And repeat daily. Oh, and finally, be good to other women. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and that wraps it up for me. Um, I guess I'll be out on the couch. Thank you. <laughs>